Things I've learned while dating a scientist. One, correlation does not equal causation. That is not why the title of this poem is While Dating a Scientist rather than From Dating a Scientist, but it did happen at the same time. Two, there is a nerve cluster in the lower back of creatures with very long spines. That's what causes tails to move autonomously. It's also why cats and tall people flail when they poo. I'm sorry about your bathroom. It's science's fault. Three, the scientific method. Go drink with your friends. Listen to one of them ask a question, Google the question on your phone, turn your phone around so your friend can see the answer. Example, so we were about three whiskeys deep at karaoke on Sunday and this blonde was singing Gretchen Wilson. I think her name was Ashley because I think most blondes are named Ashley. And one of my friends turns to me and says, why do cats? And so I Googled it and autocomplete taught me about nerve clusters and flailing science for saying science after any statement makes you 38% more credible. Example, the umbilical cord is like the internet. They're both a series of tubes and they're both full of awkward porn. Science. <laughs> Example, a placenta is a thing that exists. It's like a cocoon or a very small rock. Science. Five, I don't know very much about female anatomy. I'm unsure whether to credit this to gay misogyny or the fact that I've never taken a sex ed biology or anatomy class. I am sure that ovaries are like placentas. They are things that exist. Sometimes they explode and they're made of very small rocks. Science. Six. If you bring two fists full of pre-plucked quadriplegic turkeys to your partner's house, she will begin crying uncontrollably. You will congratulate yourself on successfully following the scientific method on doing good science, on disproving your hypothesis that bringing two fists full of pre-flood quadriplegic turkey to your partner's house would be a thing that would bring her joy and also protein. Your good science will not also be a good choice for your relationship. You will discover that there is a difference between the way someone approaches the world and the way they prefer to have the world presented to them. Seven, babies are like starfish. They flail a lot, they eat coral, and if you cut off the baby's hand, it will turn into a whole new baby. Science, eight. <laughs> Love is like science. They're both ways of understanding things that don't make sense at first glance, like very small rocks or gumbo. They both have their own languages that might seem strange to people who are unfamiliar with them. Example, all scientists speak exclusively in Klingon. All love speaks machana, uh, machete and katana. <laughs> Fuck you, Tim. I see where you're going with that. Fuck you. Sorry. All love speaks machete and katana. The language of cut and comfort both. A thing the body sleeps better beside as it recognizes the potential of something outside itself to reach through its barriers of skin or past hurts and say hello, love. It is good to be with you. Hello, everyone. <laughs> It's good to be with you. How's it going? So that's the funny shit that I'm going to do for the evening. Uh, are you okay with me getting like serious for kind of the rest of our time together? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Love is space and science. Science! Science! science. Everything is fucking science. science. <laughs> I might be saying I might be some music or something. One night when I was floating, the ceiling started talking to me. It didn't say words, but the resonance of it shook my neck like wheat shakes a cricket. The, vast mean, the vastness of loosening fields, unfurling flags, and the fog uniform history of morning every sunrise, the genealogy of absorption swallowing fire from the sky. I came back to earth with one hand on my skull's back. Another buried wrist deep and bloody in a story I wasn't telling but was choking on anyway. My boyfriend shoving charcoal down my throat until I convulsed with words I don't remember save for heave and bitter, something like a revolution whose dreamers ran out of ink painting the streets with themselves and never got to bury their stories in paper. When I was three, my mother taught me about dinosaurs and the gospel of absorption. A plastic bucket full of pine cones doubled for hunger. I didn't say anything, just watch those echoes shred and crush, learn something about birth. 
how potential life turns into the real thing, how the earth lets go its molten for piles of cold stone in a slow grinding. The night I learned about the Yucatan, I stayed up for hours, wondering how fire could blot out the sun. I thought them brothers, twin fists, curled at winter, inseparable like brothers are supposed to be, their voices close enough to be mistaken by their friends. I've never been good at telling the difference between people and not people, or a hailstorm and a machine gun, or Pompeii and Johnstown and Jonestown. Question, what is the difference between a pyroclastic flow, a bursting dam, and a cup overflowing with promises and tasteless faith? Answer, my grandmother never spoke of walking through Nagasaki after. Something about snow falling from clear skies with one flake tasting much like another, how the earth takes root in our bodies like it is a living thing, its voice close enough to our own to be mistaken by anyone who cannot tell a fistful of rocks from a thing that defines itself by hunger. It is a strange sunrise that struggles to breathe. But do not credit the sky with desperation or the horizon with gasping and gasping death rattle of sky against sky when a plume of smoke clutches the sun by the neck and shakes it. We do not call it a violence. We only call for the flame to be drowned. And my boyfriend grabbed me by the skull and forced half a burning into my flesh. I found myself thinking of dinosaurs. And it must have felt like to watch the sky burn and know it as a sunrise meant for someone yet to be born. A volcano. A lesson about hunger. And the ceiling stopped talking to me. I cried like a sunrise. For an impact crater. Hi. <laughs> How are we doing tonight? Good. Oh. It was a hell of a trip to get up here. <laughs> uh, hopped on a bus in the U District in Seattle at 4:45. Um, and then the driver was like, so there's a car crash, so we're going to be here for a little while. And then like half an hour later, like, so a traffic light's out and we're waiting for the cops to get there to direct traffic, so we're going to be here for a while. And then like half an hour after that, we got onto the freeway and then the driver was like, there's another car crash, so we're going to be here for a while. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we got off the bus at like 7.30. And now we're here, and it's so good to be here. And I'm so delighted to see y'all again. Uh, thank you for having us. Um, so, uh, as David said, and thank you for the kind introduction, um, I brought a chat book. Um, I'll be closing out tonight with a couple of poems from that. Uh, it's been a hell of a few months. And so I'm going to do some of the stuff that I've written during that time uh, off of my computer, because that's a thing. Yeah, things. <laughs> things. Casual. It's called uh, Three Laws. It's dedicated to Isaac Newton. One, objects in motion tend to stay in motion. Tell that to Sisyphus. He whisper wishful, wishful physics to his ear while his shoulders strain at the pushing. There's no inertia when you are mountain and boulder both. I remained clean three years, five months, and 23 days. It's not like Sisyphus wanted to keep going. The sobriety spins sugar-tongued spider webs. Every time you speak on its virtues, if you can only speak through one of truth's voices, you are caught before the needle crawls down the thread, too. Force is the product of mass and acceleration. I wonder if Sisyphus felt his hand blister at rope strain to stop the boulders tumbling. If he waited it at the, moment, at the mountain's base, if he's braced for the impact of his personal avalanche, I've remained clean three years, five months, 23 days. I have fled a dozen safe spaces because their softness left my feet unable to feel the ground honestly. It is a strange thing to speak of solidarity in a space without sharp edges. Stranger still to speak of safety without the possibility of harm. Three, for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. We build meaning through opposition. 
The existence of truth is the assumption at the heart of every lie. Physics is the condition of possibility for all philosophy. I have been clean 30 days. The earth opposes us. Objects in motion tend to bury themselves face first in a brick wall. Force is the product of mass defying the opposition of stillness. The boulder pushes back always. So, uh, uh, I uh, got engaged about four months ago. Oh, wow! It's been kind of fantastic, and uh, I found myself like trying to write love poems for the first time, yeah. which is so fucking weird. Yeah, it's so weird. Oh, like, God. it's, 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 yeah, yeah, it's yeah. romance. It's romance. It's romance. Um, and, like, part of what makes it weird is that, like, my fiancé keeps writing poems that are critiquing the idea of love poems. <laughs> and, like, driving people out of bars with these poems. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, this was an attempt that I've only dared to read in front of her, like, once. Uh, so, we'll see, yeah. I've never been sure why we're supposed to give our lovers roses. I'm sure they're pretty and they smell nice and they'll fucking stab you if you grab them in a way they don't like and those are qualities we're celebrating and seeking out, but the roses we give as gifts are all already dying things. Severed from their growing and wrapped in plastic and holding them is holding nothing but awaiting to wither. This may be a perfect metaphor for living while human, but it doesn't seem right for romance too close for romance, too much like a dying thing giving a dying thing to a dying thing. I've never understood the gift of diamonds either. Even if they can't die, even if they sparkle like the ocean on a cloudless afternoon when the sun is pouring itself over the rocks, an avalanche of burning holiness waiting for rose bushes to turn it sweet, I can't give a gift I don't understand, and I don't understand diamonds. How they're the wayward children of pressure. How they call to us from beneath the dirt like lovers in graveyards we visit every one of their birthdays. How a stone can be sparkling and dripping with blood both. It's almost funny how every gesture we call romance has a fist closed around its vocal cords before they faint to shake the word love into the air. It's almost funny how much weight we put on the air to carry our romance like it's more solid than our bodies. I'm not sure it isn't. If I could give a gift of air, I would, but that gift disappears when it leaves my hands. It can be given only from one mouth to another. It tastes more of desperation than joy. I have no desire to give desperate gifts. A gift from desperation is little more than a demand. I do not like to make demands of those I love, even or especially that they keep breathing. And isn't that something like love? The kind of breathing we don't want to control. Isn't that something like laughter? I'd rather gift wrap a terrible joke and a soulful smile than be forced to force breath into my lover's lungs if violence and death lurk in the background of every love poem and every gesture we've been taught to call romantic is a cut flower shedding wilted petals onto an operating table built from the broken promise that we would be kind to each other forever. I'd rather listen to my lover speak in a voice built from steady breath and lean to her ear and say, I heard you like I heard a rose bush growing outside my window. The sun pouring itself onto the leaves, one handful of diamonds at a time. It sounded like breathing. It sounded alive. So that poem's called Roses, and I guess it's somewhat fitting. Um, this poem is called Roses Too, and it has, it's, it's different. The Rosening? The Rosening. Say it. Yeah. Roses Too, The Rosening. Or Roses Too, Rose Electric Boogaloo. <laughs> or, uh, you know, Roses Too, Cruise Control. Or, you know, however you want. Yes. I see you. All right. So, completely different shit. 
and it is somehow a sequel to the first one. The first time I think I killed someone, I was 13 years old. I sprinted around the corner, my chest heaving, caught myself on a fence. My fingers blossoming red from rough chain raised the 38 my first rapist gave me. Sided down the barrel like he taught me, pulled the trigger. Watched flesh explode outwards, a rose flowering and wilting in an instant. I don't know if that boy died that night. I know his body moved and then didn't. I know I didn't feel the recoil for two blocks. Not until I ducked into an alley, my chest still heaving, my stomach just starting to, and I planted myself behind a dumpster, and I shook until my first rapist grabbed me by the shoulders. Come on, cops going, gotta go now, and his hand shook, and our boot heels uprooted a flurry of echoes, and then every voice I've ever heard talks about rape, it builds monsters. Not frightened children who do monstrous things, not the boys I've known. Their chests shaking with terror like roses in the winter wind as they held me down. He promised me safety, or both, and the first time I saw someone die, I was sure he was two weeks older. He was my third rapist, and he was shaking on a stained mattress in the first space I had ever called safe, the one we both ran away to. And I watched him, and I thought about roses, how they pulled themselves from the graves that birthed them, and I shook, and his body moved, and then didn't, and... The last time I saw someone die, I was sure I was 19 years old. He was my fifth rapist, the one who held me down the first time after his pills blossomed me numb the second time to force charcoal down my throat and uproot the garden of poison I'd planted in my stomach. He ran onto the building steps. The police followed. He stared like a rose stares at the sunset. He pulled the trigger. He blossomed, and I saw every perfect flower laid on his closed casket. My beautiful boy with the perfect future, my rapist, my rescuer, and I shook, and I ran. I caught myself more blocks later than I can remember. My chest heaving, my stomach just starting to my empty hands, painting roses on cinder block walls. It's been seven years. I haven't watched anyone die since then, and I watch those same deaths every time I close my eyes, and I still can't walk past a rose bush without shaking, and I still don't know how I'm supposed to feel because most of the people who rape me are dead, and they are still human, and some of them are alive, and they are still human, and I'm still more grateful than I should be or less grateful than I should be. And two years ago, I visited Scotty's grave with a handful of roses. I threw them into the ocean rather than laying them by the headstone. I wondered if the salt would creep into the stems and kill them before they could rot in the water. I did not run away. I did not have to forgive him. I did not forgive him. 